Hello again, friends. This is case study number five on epigastric pain. Uh, I have a Patreon, so uh, if you are interested in helping to sponsor my channel, I really appreciate all the support I can get. I've got the link in the description of the video if you're interested. I thank you very much in advance for your consideration. Okay, so we got a 55-year-old Chinese-American man who presents to the clinic complaining of an intermittent abdominal pain worsening over the past four months. So we're dealing with chronic abdominal pain here, more than three months. He says that the pain typically comes on after meals and gradually goes away after eating. He has had episodes like this over the past couple years, but it's recently gotten worse. The pain is somewhat improved with over-the-counter antacids and is worsened when laying down. He endorses increasing fatigue over the last two months. He denies fever, constipation, diarrhea, and vomiting. Review of systems is otherwise unremarkable. He's married, works as an electrician, and smokes half a pack of cigarettes per day for the last 30 years and drinks socially. He denies recreational drug use. He has no significant past medical history and takes no medications. Vitals are within normal limits, and his BMI is 30.5, which puts him into the obese range. All right, so what is our impression of this patient? He has chronic abdominal pain that's worsening, and he is fatigued, so there's the possibility of anemia here. Okay, so our physical exam, uh, he's in no apparent distress. His skin, lymph nodes, uh, head, eyes, ears, nose, throat, chest and lungs, heart, abdomen, rectal, all normal. Everything is normal. So it's very important when you've got these patients with abdominal pain or anything GI related, you want to get a, do a rectal exam, check the stool for blood. That's very important that you do that. That often gets overlooked. So uh, when you're taking your CCS, you got to make sure you include that. Okay, so what is our differential? Well, uh, we definitely want to include reflux disease. Very, very, very common cause of abdominal pain, epigastric abdominal pain. Uh, we want to include peptic ulcer disease. It's very difficult to tell GERD apart from PUD and also gastritis. So these three are very common causes of epigastric abdominal pain, and you can't really tell them apart. You get a little bit of clues with your uh, history, but for the most part, they're very difficult to tell apart just based on history and physical exam. Biliary colic is a possibility, and then we got some of the more nefarious causes of epigastric pain, uh, esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, and then there's functional dyspepsia, which is a diagnosis of exclusion, and we always have to keep an eye out for anemia because he is fatigued. All right, so our initial workup, we're going to get a CBC checking for that anemia. We're going to get a uh, electrolytes, and we're, we're going to get liver function tests. We're talking about GI stuff, so you should typically include liver function tests when you have a patient who's got abdominal pain. We're going to get an EKG. Sometimes chest pain gets appreciated as abdominal pain. Always important to, uh, to check for that. He's a smoker. He's middle-aged, kind of approaching older age. And then we're going to get an upper endoscopy with biopsy. Because this is chronic abdominal pain, you should always get an endoscopy uh, for that. Now, would you need to get pancreatic enzymes? Probably not, because acute pancreatitis, although it's epigastric, um, is typically not something that you live with for months. It's more acute. So we get our labs, uh, and everything is within normal limits. Um, the upper endoscopy with biopsy shows salmon-colored epithelium extending for proximally from the gastroesophageal junction. There's no masses. Good. Biopsy of the distal esophagus shows columnar metaplasia. There's no evidence of dysplasia. And the gastric and duodenal mucosa are normal. So that rules out gastritis. And it rules out peptic ulcer disease. These findings are consistent with Barrett's esophagus, which comes from long-standing GERD. So we have our diagnosis. 
So our management for presumptive GERD and uh, Barrett's esophagus is going to be proton pump inhibitors, namely omeprazole. And then as part of our CCS, we need to advise healthy lifestyle habits. Some of these are going to be direct causes of GERD or risk factors. Others we just have to do. So we know the patient smokes, he's overweight, and he drinks. Drinking makes reflux worse. So we want to advise against all that. We want to advise him to stop smoking. We want to advise him to stop alcohol use. We want to advise him to lose weight, go on an exercise program, low calorie diet. And then we want to advise him to sit upright after meals. Typically three hours after a meal, you sit upright, get that stomach emptied out. Uh, and that should improve symptoms, particularly before you go to bed. And then we'll refer him to gastroenterology for surveillance, and that's due to the Barrett's esophagus, puts you at higher risk of developing uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma. So reflux is a clinical diagnosis. It can be diagnosed and managed without endoscopy, but endoscopy should be performed in patients who have alarm symptoms or who have multiple risk factors for Barrett's esophagus. So the alarm symptoms are anemia, dysphagia, hematemesis, melena, persistent vomiting, or involuntary weight loss. All of those things point to the possibility of cancer, so we do uh, endoscopy in those cases. And then Barrett's esophagus risk factors, which you can read there. So if the patient fits those criteria, you always wanna get an endoscopy. However, if the patient doesn't really fit any, any of those criteria, you can hold off on the endoscopy and just go straight to proton pump inhibitors. Other findings common in GERD, you've probably seen this a million times if you've worked in the ER, sore throat, metallic taste, hoarseness, chronic cough, wheezing. The management for GERD is proton pump inhibitors and lifestyle modifications, pretty much what we did in this patient. And if they do have Barrett's esophagus, as long as there's no dysplasia, you can do three to five year follow-up. Uh, that's not super important for you to know for CCS, but you do want to make sure that you refer them to gastroenterology. This is a nice little cartoon of uh, all the different causes of abdominal pain. We were talking about epigastric abdominal pain. Some of these we didn't check for because they're very acute. This was going on for several months. So we didn't really think of acute pank. We didn't really think of mesenteric ischemia. We didn't really think of pericarditis. Uh, MI we kind of checked for. We didn't really check for AAA or aortic dissection. All right, so uh, this is just your list here of what was on a differential and what would kind of point to it. Notice that the main three things that I said are very difficult to differentiate apart can be differentiated by endoscopy and biopsy. Malignancy typically shows up in older adults and they have alarm signs. That's why you keep an eye out for that, but you can also differentiate that out by endoscopy. Biliary colic does have abdominal pain that worsens with meals, kind of like this patient, but this tends to be dull, achy pain in the right upper quadrant. Okay, so just to recap, GERD is a clinical diagnosis. Barrett's esophagus is diagnosed by EGD and biopsy. Uh, the presenting signs of GERD are nonspecific epigastric pain, usually long-standing. It can radiate upward to the chest. We call that an ascending abdominal pain. Examination is typically unremarkable, and you got to make sure you do that rectal exam. The stool should not show occult blood. GERD does not bleed. However, what can bleed are ulcers. Endoscopy should be performed in patients with alarm signs or multiple risk factors for Barrett's. And the management is proton pump inhibitors and lifestyle modifications. Make sure and repeat the EGD every three to five years in patients who have Barrett's without dysplasia.